A very warm welcome to you from Equa Marketing. This presentation is brought to you by Equa.com, a leader in digital marketing. Hello, everyone. Welcome to another session of Growing Dentist podcast series. Today, I'm super excited to have Dr. Phelps with me. Dr. Christopher Phelps is a renowned dentist. He teaches other dentists. Plus, he runs his own dental practices. Plus, he has a few businesses that help dentists. I'm so glad you're here today, Dr. Phelps. And uh, maybe we can start by you introducing yourself and uh, talking about uh, you know where we met, which is Strategic Coach. Yeah, definitely. Um, you know, I'm in uh, Charlotte, North Carolina, a uh, general dentist. Um, Still treating patients, uh, usually about uh, one to two days a week if I'm in town. Um, you know, it's kind of interesting, my story. I'm from North Carolina originally, but when I graduated in 2003, uh, I realized um, that I was kind of a an entrepreneur who happened to be a good dentist, you know. And uh, and my goal was at the time was growth for growth's sake, right? get as many um, offices as possible, you know. So my original partner – who I'd started with had done about $600,000 in collections a year in a true what we call fee-for-service office. So if he, you know, he charged $1,200 for his crown, well, you know, he got paid $1,200 today, and then he would file the patient's insurance, and they would wait on the reimbursement money. So he had kind of a unique proposition, which nobody really around them had, but he was in an older facility. But I, I saw a great opportunity, and he let me invest some of his money originally before I was a partner into my marketing ideas to get myself – opportunities and patients. And the benefit was, well, I grew us through those marketing efforts and other things I created from one location doing 600000 a year to four locations doing $6.5 a year in about seven years, so 10 times the business, if you will. Uh, and a big factor for that was I discovered, uh, like you did, that strategic coach, uh, Dan Sullivan. And it was the first time I really had met a place that, that ask me questions I never knew to ask myself and not being a business major or whatever. And it forced me to, to face my problems and, and I didn't break them down into their little elemental essence, if you will. So my brain can actually start working on solving them and, and creating solutions for my little problems uh, to grow. And uh, it's really kept me focused on, on, on the goal. You know, where do I need to be in the next 90 days? Okay. Where do we need to be the next 90 days? And when you start transitioning that way and resetting your GPS like that every 90 days, as you can see from my results, a lot of powerful things can happen. And, and if it wasn't for coach, I can definitely say I probably that wouldn't have happened for me. Um, so about year seven or eight, there I was with those practices. And, and thanks to coach, I realized I had kind of delegated too much and lost control of my business to, to my other partners. So I decided I needed to regain control of that business to kind of get more freedom of time and, and money and, and, and purpose. Uh, and so what I decided to do was I, you know, it sounds a little crazy now, but <laughs> looking back on it, uh, I, I sold my two highest producing, uh, least debt offices for profit. And I, I took over the debt for our two highest debt, lowest producing offices. Uh, one of which was a brand new office. It was only about 10 months old, uh, that had probably done maybe $400,000 in collections for the entire year up to that point. Um. Uh, Problem was, you know, collecting thirty-five thousand to forty thousand a month, it was costing me seventy thousand a month in expenses <laughs> every month. Uh, so a lot of money going out, not a lot of money coming back in. Well, I think Plato said it best, right? Necessity is the mother of invention. So when I my two lease producing offices combined did about one point six million that year between the two of them, I knew I really had to focus in and figure out what was going on and what these issues were. Um, from one side, it was a new patient side, right? I needed more new patients. I was only getting, you know, 60 a month, like 30 at each office. Problem was I was spending around 36,000 a month to get those 60 people. So a lot of money going out and not a lot of new patients coming back in. So I knew I had a problem and had to do something about it. And I tried different tracking services and whatnot out there. And, and, you know, they were kind of scratching at the truth, but nobody really gave me what I felt were like the five most important data points and how I like to track marketing and what I think we need for our businesses to make sure kind of two sides of the marketing coin, right? Making sure that the ads are bringing in enough quantity, but more importantly, quality of new patients, meaning they're going to be here in eight months. They're not off to the next special and they're spending enough to justify what it costs you to get them. Or is it the other side of the marketing coin and we're not answering the telephone 
and we're not converting the ones of the people we do talk to. And for my own purposes, my own team, that was the issue is that lost opportunity side. You know, we didn't answer 220 new patient phone calls a month <laughs> from our marketing sources. And if we did answer, we only converted 24% of those into appointments. <laughs> so you can imagine the, how I felt at the time uh, discovering that. But it allowed me to dig into the why behind these. Why aren't we answering these calls? And what are we saying to people? Are we creating the barriers or is it the patients creating the barriers to scheduling? What is going on? And so I was able to work on that and give my tra uh, my team the, the tools and the training they needed to fix those issues. So flash forward about four months later, and you know we're averaging 300 new patients a month instead of 60. Um, you know we're converting 86% of the calls we talk to into appointments, and we're missing less than 10% of them now. So a significant change for the patients I was already paying good money for, right? But just couldn't tap into. Let, let me let me let me get this straight. So you went from two offices uh, spending 36,000, getting 60 new patients. Still not changing what you're doing marketing wise, but now you're getting how many patients? I mean, uh, I was five getting, months at later. the time, yeah, 300. 300. So 60 went to 300. And the reason is A, you are not missing those 200 phone calls, you're only missing 10%. And B, instead of converting 24%, you're converting what percent? Yeah, over 86%. 86%. So that's amazing. So you tripled the number of people who said yes just by changing the way you guys answered the phone. That was it. Identifying that there was, a, as I call it, the, the fire alarm and the security alarm. In this case, you know, if you're not answering your telephone and your, your team is not converting patients into appointments, it's kind of like your house is on fire, right? And, and wouldn't you want to know that you an alarm system to tell you that the house is on fire <laughs> so you can do something to put right. the fire out? Um, so that's what I did, right. you know, and that's kind of the the side of that I focused on. And then, of course, once we got him in the chair, you know, then I, I focused on something called uh, Dr. Robert Cialdini's Six Principles of, of Persuasion, and I uh, was fortunate enough to be able to train under Dr. Cialdini directly to and to be one of his certified trainers and figure out how do we use these the science of influence and persuasion for dentistry. So now I got all these people in the chair, but if they're not saying yes to treatment. Or the the things we're asking them for referrals, for reviews, to pay their bill today, et cetera. Well, it's not going to do us any good as well, right? It kind of goes back to that quality of patient and what they're spending. Um, so I've spent a lot of time focusing on that and creating those systems for my practices. And so, you know, those, those two practices that were doing 1.6 million, three years later did six million in total. So from one six to six. So basically, did with two offices what I did with four in collections. You know, I've just sold one of those offices for, uh, for profit now, and I'm down to one office, uh, and I'm going to take it from three million, and within two years I'll have it doing six million. So basically, another challenge trying to prove I can do with one office what I used to do with four. So instead of growth for growth's sake, right, maximizing the capacity and grow within my own office, <laughs> so to speak. Absolutely. Two things I want to kind of piggyback on. Just like you, I'm a huge fan of Dan, you know, who uh, created Strategic Coach, and I too am a student of Dan. It's amazing. I mean, it's, it's unbelievable. And uh, uh, I can go on and on about all the things I've learned. Um, the other thing is, yes, Robert is a genius. I've read his book as well. Um, you know, obviously I haven't been trained by him. Why don't we jump into a few things? Let's talk yeah. about the phones, right? So yeah. you shared... You know, you started investigating. How come you know, hundred people are calling, calling, saying they, you know, calling because they want to do something, but only twenty-four said yes. So, what did you find out when you dug deep? What What was the reason? Obviously, the obvious suspects are we answer the phone. You know, that's easy. Um, yeah. But beyond that, what else did you find out? You know, why it was not converting in other words why 76 percent were not saying yes and how were you yeah, going to change it? let's definitely. talk about some examples and some different things yeah so one of the things i do with my tracking company is i give reports on your staff members not only how do they convert each opportunity they had but if they did not book the call i give you the transcript of why and i kind of categorize it because and this is what i did for my own team because i need to know i don't have time to listen to these things but if you can give me the report and tell and i can see what they said I can see the barriers a lot quicker. And so what I realized were it really found the three main areas. Number one was capacity. So a patient's calling today for to get in for a cleaning and you can't get them in for three or four weeks. 
right? You don't have capacity to see them when the patient wants to be seen, you know. Uh, and as we know, if we're not getting them in within one to two weeks, they're not – they're going to find somewhere else, and they're going to be a no-show in your practice. Or somebody was calling with a toothache or a broken front tooth, and, and the office literally was telling them they can't get in for three days. I mean, that's a capacity issue, you know, and that could be solved a couple of ways, right? Expanding your hours, adding more hygienists, adding more doctors. But for me, it was more I like to let the data justify the next expense behind it, right? So that's kind of what I looked at. And so capacity. So I opened up Fridays because I saw that's when people were trying to get in. I opened up later hours because people couldn't take off of work anymore. I added more doctors. I added more hygienists to, to address that. Um, the next one was the uh, the insurance question. Yeah, the, to me, there's a difference between the person who says, mindset-wise, of the person who asks the office, "Do you take or accept my insurance?" versus the patient says, "Are you in network with my insurance?" and and then ask about the insurance company. To me, those are two very different people. You know, we'll start with the one who says, "Are you in network with?" Well, they've already kind of made a commitment, if you will, which is one of Dr. Chaudhary's principles of consistency. And once people make commitments like that, it's very hard to change their mind. Unless you get them to make a new commitment, okay, that's contrary to the one they said before. The problem is we don't have time to do that on the telephone and definitely not talking to them for the first time. So those patients, their mindset is they think it's about the insurance. They think they need someone in network, and so it's a it's a tough conversion. So I came up with some strategies to to try to convert them, and but telling them the truth that we're not in network, but you know it's probably only going to work 20% of the time, okay. But that's okay. That's that's in, turns out that's not the majority of people calling our practice like we may think it is or our, our staff is telling us is who is calling. So the other main percentage of people, I'd say 80% of the time, it's that patient says, do you take or accept my insurance? And basically what I found out from this person, their mindset is they don't really know or understand what their dental insurance is. It is not an issue for them, and it is not a barrier, but it's our team creating the barrier both in office and on the telephone for these people. And then suddenly, because they put this up as a barrier, now it's about the insurance. And so what, what I hear is the patient says, do you take or accept my insurance? And the office says, no, we're not in network. Okay, well, and here's how I know the patient doesn't know or understand what the dental insurance is or what it means. Because here's what the patient says after that. So what do you mean? I can't come there? I can't – you can't be my dentist? And they're like, nope, Sorry. Hang up and call your insurance company. Thanks. Which is crazy, wow. right? I mean, it's a huge opportunity that people are leaving on the table. These are great patients because I've got them in all of my practices, <laughs> you know, and they don't care that I'm out of network. It never even comes up as an issue. They just want to know ultimately the mindset of people is what's it going to cost me in the sense of, hey, here's your fee, but how much am I writing a check for? What am I swiping my credit card for? So if you're taking my, if you're waiting on my insurance, which I do, then that, all they want to know is what's my part. And as long as you're fair with that and tell them, you'll never have an issue, right? So I changed their minds, my own team's mindset on who they were talking to instead of prejudging these people. Um, and then the last one, of course, is the price shopper. Hey, how much is your cleaning? How much is your crown? How much is this? How much is that? And so I, I you know, there's a couple. I create a strategy that'll get you. You know, two thirds of those people, so almost seventy percent, if you will, will schedule. Um, you know, the other third, you're not going to schedule them at that time because they're they just have a mindset they need to call four or five offices and price check everyone. But if you follow my strategy and anchor them to and contrast them using some of the signs of influence, well, many of them like what they heard from you and contrasted it to what everybody else said, which was the same thing. And they're going to call you back, so I'll get a good percentage of those, almost 80% of them in total who are coming in. And it's not about the price for them. It's honestly it's what we say or do before we talk about the price. But to do that, we got to get them into the office. <laughs> okay, so this is one of those things that kind of gets them over that mindset. Uh, but those are the big three, you know, capacity, uh, the insurance yeah. question, and uh, the price shopper. So. Oh, this is awesome. You know, I'm really having fun with this interview. Um, let me ask two follow-up questions. Uh, I understand capacity, right? You know, uh, people, you know, want to see somebody now. They don't want to wait. I mean, those days are gone. I press a button, I get Uber, you know, at my door in two minutes. So you're telling me I have to wait now? Yeah. Wrong answer. Click, right? 
or even yeah. if they if even if they are polite and saying yes, you know, they they still don't wait. They find somebody else and don't show up for the appointment. Um, yep. Now let's kind of dive a little bit around the insurance question. I understand the first group, right? People uh, who already believe that you're not in their plan, uh, sorry, in their in their network. Therefore, you're not right fit. You know, that's a hard sell. But the yep. second type, can we go a little bit deeper on that? Like, I want to know. Um, you said, you know, they don't even think it's an issue, but your team makes it an issue. So how did you train your team? Like, what do they do differently? How did you change their mindset? I just wanted to kind of uh, give some value to our listeners about, you know, if they have this kind of a situation, how they can help. Yeah, well, first I had to change their mindset by using uh, consensus or social proof. So I had to I had to show them and, and download recordings and show them the transcripts of what the patient was saying that because they, they didn't even register in their minds. Right, but I had to show them. Look how many times this issue comes up, and we're saying the same thing every time. And eighty percent of the time, the patient wants to come here, right? And you just prevented it from doing it. They're asking questions like, "What does my insurance mean? Why do I? Why can't I go there? Well, I don't know what you're talking about." You know, the patients are confused. You see it in their answers right here. So I had to show them right. that for the majority, this is what's going on. But they're they, what I realized was they. They all had that one or two patient that came in the office. Maybe they said, you know, answered the question, do you take or accept my insurance? They said, sure, come on in. And then suddenly the patient's trying to check out, and they're like, what do you mean you're not in network? What do you mean i got to pay something? And they're flipping out, and they're freaking out on them. And they yelled at them, and they had one bad experience, and now they're using that and judging every other person that's calling them on the phone. So they're letting one keep them from the 100, <laughs> you know, who it really right. isn't an issue for. But the truth of it is if they had just had a better system on how to handle that person, if that situation comes up one out of a hundred times, then it's never an issue, right? Um, and, so, and now we don't have to prejudge everyone, and that's what I told them. I said that was the realization. We just don't have a system to handle what you're afraid of, so let's create it now. It is what's going to happen. Here's the protocol, and we're going to make it a non-issue for that person. So if they're if something happened between now and when they made the appointment, and now money is an issue for that patient. And now they're concerned they got to pay 20 bucks out of pocket or whatever it is. Okay, well, waive it for them. Make it a non issue. You know, get rid of the money. I don't care. Make it free for that visit. And you say, look, this is just the way we operate. We understand. Sorry for the confusion. Um, you know, we understand if you feel like you need to go somewhere in network, uh, we would think you'll find a, a different experience than what you had today. But just know that we wish you well and you're always welcome back. If it doesn't work out, but if, when you do so come back, they, you're gonna have to pay, you know, whatever your copay is, right? Your twenty dollars bucks or whatever. And so, right. I mean, the few times this may actually happen, you've made it, taken out the money issue for the patient, so they're not paying anything, right? So they're happy. And then if they do go right. somewhere in network, they're gonna contrast that experience to the great one they had at your office, and that's not gonna be the same. <laughs> and I've gotten right. many of these patients to come back. <laughs> Right, and and they're paying, and they're great patients. But it it wasn't until I realized their fear and the the one situation blocking us from the 100 that I was like, all right, well that's the answer. We got to create the system there, and now we open up and re get rid of the barrier on the telephone. Right. So it's just what I understand. Um, they call. They're not necessarily saying, are you in network? They are saying, do you take my insurance? And it's your people who have had the negative experience who pretty much say, well, you're not in network. You know, sorry, right? So you right. had to show show exactly what was going on based on the recordings to your people, so you can help them realize that the client necessarily did not have an issue, but we are creating an issue, and maybe that negative experience you had made you create that issue, right? Yes. Now correct. you cannot do it. Now, how do they deal with it? Like, I mean, can you just give me like what they would say for a patient like this, like? How do they deal with it? Like you know, uh, because you know, uh, you know, people are people. So if they're afraid, how do like just give me some color? Yeah, I mean, it's it's fairly simple. Uh, you know, do you take or accept my insurance? Yes, we do. <laughs> we work with all major insurance companies, right? And if there's any portion right. due, we'll let you know. Uh, how did you hear about us? And then immediately we go into trying to take over control of the phone call to find out. I want to know where they came from. As one little cue, right. if you will, and then we try to then use the, you know, one of the principles uh, Dr. Chini, Dr. Cialdini talks about is, you know, com consistency and commitments. 
And people need a choice. This kind of falls under the commitment principle. If they didn't really have a voluntary choice, they didn't really make a commitment to be there. But to have a choice, you know, you know, our team typically, this is what the call goes. Hey, can you be here Tuesday at 2? And the patient says, no, I can't do that. All right, can you be here Wednesday at 4? Nope, can't do that. Uh, Thursday at 8? Okay, yeah, I can do that. Right? And so you, the, the, your staff member thinks they gave the patient a choice. Well, I gave them three times. But they really didn't. They dictated one choice at a time and only gave another choice when the patient said no. But that person didn't really commit to that because they didn't have a choice. So what we say instead is, and once we know where they heard about us, then we say, okay, great. Well, what works best for you this week or next week? Okay, morning or afternoon, 2 o'clock or 4 o'clock. We always give two choices. And this is something I, I like seeing successes from other businesses. And I'd like to say I was the originator of this, but I'm definitely not. Uh, but Marriott was one of the first people, the hotel chain, that came up with this concept of giving people choices, and then saw how powerful it was for people to show up for their reservation. Okay, so you gotta you can funnel them down to whatever appointment times you have, but, and give them two choices along the way. Oh, I can only do Wednesdays. Okay, this Wednesday or next Wednesday, <laughs> right? It, it, it's an infinite an infinite number of possibilities to funnel them where you need them to go. Um, and it's as simple as that. Why you? When you give them choices and they are making the choice, now they are more committed to the choice, correct? Every time they answer the question, they've made more and more and more of a commitment to be there. Right, right. Makes perfect sense. Now, you mentioned another case, right? The price shop, shopper. Can you give us some color on that? Uh, just give us, yeah. you know, what happened. So with the price shopper, like I said, in their mindset, they've made this commitment that it's about the price. Right, And it's very hard, as I said, when people make commitments to get them to change their mind unless we get them to make a new commitment, which in this case we can't do over the telephone. So we're not going to change them out of that. So we need to figure a way around this barrier. So the first thing I try to do, well, if price is an issue for this person in their mind, let's try to remove the price barrier. So I am not a proponent. I don't give specials like a $99 special for patients or anything like that. I don't usually give discounts. But my team knows this is the one person, this mindset, that I'm okay giving a free exam and x-ray consultation to. I don't care how many x-rays it takes to figure out their problem or what they're looking for um, or to talk right, to get a treatment plan because I just want to take away the price barrier for them because that's what it is. So for them, I'll waive it. So I tell my team, whatever you do, try not to give a price for our product or whatever the service they're asking for. Number two… And this is for the doctor's side, right, if they're asking for the doctor's price of something like an implant or a root canal or whatever, a crown. And there's different strategies for hygiene, but the, you know, the doctor one's an easy one to start with. So you know, how much is your crown? Well, I tell you what. Everybody's different. We obviously don't know what you need because we're not looking at you. So why don't we get you in for a free or complimentary x-ray and exam with the doctor? You'll talk, you'll have a treatment plan, you'll know exactly what your issue is and how much it costs before we do anything. Does that work for you? Great. What works best for you this week or next week? Morning or afternoon? Two o'clock or four o'clock? You know, you just go right in to try to schedule them. And that's going to work on about a third of them. The next third, no matter what you do, they're still going to want the price. They're going to say, no, no, come on. How much is your ground? Or maybe it's an extraction, right? How much is your extraction? Because we, we hear that one a lot. Uh, tell me, tell me the price. I'm not going to leave until I get the price. You know, they keep pushing your team, and you say, okay, all right. Well, if you want to know our extraction, because again, the problem our team makes is they they think they know what the patient needs, or they are too trusting and believe the patient knows what they need, <laughs> right. right? But sadly, nine times out of ten, they're both wrong. <laughs> the patients have no idea what they need. They're coming in and asking about a crown, and you look at the tooth, and it, it's got to come out. You can't even be safe. Or you know the, right. the team thought it was about something, and the patient gets into the chair, and it's about something completely different. So we got to get those judgments out of there, and let's just keep it simple. Sorry, do you want to know about extraction? Great. Well, I started asking myself this. What is my most inexpensive extraction? Because the, the key is when but before you throw any number out at somebody on the telephone, you have to anchor them to a different number first. This is part of the science of influence. Okay. Right, you have to anchor them to a different number first, and that number could be higher or lower than the number you're about to give them depending on how you want to contrast it. Right? Do you want your number to sound really good, much better, or do you want it to sound worse in comparison? Right? So 
or you want it to sound like a deal in comparison versus more expensive. So for this case, I like to anchor them to my starting at price. So I talk to doctors and I say, docs, what's your, your cheapest extraction in an adult? And they all say the same thing. Well, a simple extraction could be anywhere from 150 to 250 bucks, depending on the office where you are nationwide. And I say, okay, simple extraction, sure. Is that the most inexpensive extraction you could do on an adult? And they always answer the same question. You always say, yeah. And I say, okay. Have you ever had an adult with a with a kid's tooth, with a pedo tooth? Have you ever taken one of those out on an adult? Oh yeah. How often? Pretty, pretty regularly. You know, we get a couple cases a month. And I said, okay. So how do you know this person on the telephone is not asking about their baby tooth that needs to come out, even though they're an adult? Right. <laughs> the key is you you don't, right? So stop judging them. Right. So we use our pedo starts out at seventy nine bucks. And it goes up from there depending on what you need. I tell you what, let's get you in for that complimentary exam and x-ray. You'll know exactly what your tooth needs, what it'll cost before we do anything. What do you think? Right. So we try to give them a starting at price and anchor them to that and then offer them the free exam and x-ray again. And typically, like I said, you'll get another third. We'll usually schedule on that. Um, you know, dentures. They're calling about a new denture. Well, don't give them your denture fee. Give them a reline fee because how do you know they just don't need a reline of their existing denture, right? So right. instead of two grand for a new denture, they start out at 500 bucks and they go up from there depending on what you need. Let's get you in for right. free, examine extra, and we'll figure it out, and you'll know before we do anything. So the last right. third, this is why I like to anchor them to the starting at price because they're just going to go – they have to go. You might have been the first person they called. But as I said, they got to go call four or five other people, or they're not going to feel satisfied, right? They have to price shop, right. so to speak. But they're going to call these other offices, and everyone is saying the same thing. Oh, the exam, X-ray, and blah 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 is two hundred fifty bucks, and our surgical extraction is three fifty, and or but you might need a root canal for eight fifty two, and we could save it, and then it could need a crown for twelve hundred. Well, every number you throw at that person on the phone, they are adding those numbers up in their head, whether you realize it or not. And at the end, the patient's like, holy crap, it's $4,000 to go there. <laughs> I can't go there. <laughs> I'm going to go call that other right. guy that said it started at 79 bucks and goes up from there because right. I have anchored them to me now right? and my starting at price. And in contrast, when they call any other office, guess what's going to sound better? Me. And I know some people are wondering this right now. Well, yeah, but what do they say when they get in the chair? Are they all mad because they didn't get the $79? No, because you told them the truth. They start at this, but that's not what you need. Here's what you need, <laughs> right? right? So you educate. Right. You do all the things you do normally. Well, look how bombed out this tooth is. Yep. Well, it's not just a simple extraction. It's surgical, or it's not a pedo extraction. It's it's an adult tooth, and it's going to be a doozy, you know. And here's what we're going to have to do, and here's what's going to cost. Simple as that. I've never had one person even ask the question, "Why isn't it 79 bucks?" After we've gone through our education and shown them what they needed for them. And number two, if they did, right, well, you've told them the truth. You should feel good about that and ethical about it. So It's amazing. You know, like, um, so we talked about um, mindsets, uh, routine. We talked about, um, you know, how to use some of these principles from Robert and, you know, uh, influence people. You're not really worried about the final step. You're just worried about the next step, right? And, and uh so one thing I just had a question on. You said for price shoppers, you're willing to give a free exam and x-rays. Why, what made you decide that? I just was curious. Well, for me, because it goes, like I said, they've committed to this idea that it's about the price, right? So it's about the numbers. Right. Every little number matters to them. So if I can get rid of one of those barriers on price, which is it's not going to cost you anything to come in and see what the problem is and see what you need. Because everywhere else, right. they're charging for that. Right. So in in right. contrast, I'm going to sound better than everyone else, but I know that's one of the ways I can lessen their barrier and set the stage for them to come in. Now, once they come in, it's totally different. I'm going to – part of my – what I teach in my case acceptance stuff with the influence is I'm going to get them to make a new commitment on what type of patient they're going to be in my practice. What do they value the most, and what are their objections to getting dentistry done? Okay, What are the hurdles to getting this done? Right, Because I would rather know that on the front end. And so you can take this and change someone's mindset from that patient who, say, comes in and says, well, I'm only going to do what my insurance covers, to educating them and, and, and anchoring them to the consequences of not doing their treatment 
and how it conflicts with their previous statement. And people, as I, as, as I mentioned before, don't like to be seen as inconsistent. That's why Cialdini's consistency principle is so powerful. But you got to get them to make a new commitment, um, which is one of the things we do when they're in my office anyway. So. Can you tell me more about – like I'm a dentist. I want to learn more about um, you know, your scheduling uh, center or you know, your call tracking. Uh, also, more about you know, uh, Robert – Cialdini and or uh, the classes you do. Can you tell me a little bit more before we jump into how you apply Robert's principles at your office? Yeah, definitely. Uh, my call tracking company is called Call Tracker ROI, like for return on investment. So it's just calltrackerroi.com, all one word. Um, and then my influence trainings for dentistry uh, to teach on this case acceptance um, systems, uh, referral systems. Uh, decreasing no shows, everything is at uh, www.guidethemtoyes.com. So guide g u i d e them to yes dot com. Um, so I have my courses listed there, and occasionally, if you can't get to me with your team, then I do come out and do private trainings on that as well. So this is amazing. Can we jump a little bit about? Okay, we talked about the phone a lot. Can we jump? You know, what happens once people show up? Uh, again, yeah. things that you learn uh, from persuasion or persuasion and uh, the other book and his courses and what you have figured out on your own for dentistry. Yeah, definitely. Well, you know, for those that don't know Dr. Cialdini's work, there are six main principles of influence um, and persuasion. And so uh, the first one is uh, reciprocity. Uh, many of us have heard this before, right? If someone gives you a gift of value, you instinctively feel the need to give back something, right? If somebody gives you a gift, then right. typically we're going to give them a gift or we're going to give them like a gift card, right? Or a thank you note or something to, to say thanks. But typically if somebody gives you something or helps you in some way, we feel the need to give back. That's reciprocity. Uh, liking. Um, we like to do business with people we like, <laughs> Uh, we like to do business with our friends, right? Even sometimes if it's not in our best interest to do our friends, right? So how can we use reciprocity and liking to build better relationships with our patients? Uh, if, if they're willing to, you're helping them out and they're willing to give back and they like you, well, now they're more likely to say yes. Um, consensus, so social proof, we talked about that one, right? The evidence of what others are doing in their behavior many times has a powerful effect on our behavior. So we look to others to show us what we should be doing as well. In times of uncertainty, when we don't know what we should be doing, we definitely look to others to see what they are doing as a guide for us. Uh, but also in situations where we do know what we should do, the evidence of what others are doing can affect what we do okay, and whether we say yes or not. Um, the authority principle. Well, many times we look to credible experts to tell us what we should do. You know, I don't have time to be the expert in this subject or to, to do the – the amount of studying it took to be this kind of like I think of plumbers in this way. Uh, you know, if a plumber's at my house, I don't know anything about the plumbing and toiletries and all that kind of stuff. And hey, so if the plumber says I need a uh, a new toilet, well, it's okay. The expert's telling me I got to have a new toilet, so I guess I'm getting a new toilet. That's as simple as that, right? Many times we look to experts to tell us what we should do. And you know, uh, consistency, right? As I mentioned before, consistency is all about commitments. Um, if somebody makes a commitment, a true commitment, it is there's a lot of external and internal pressure on them to stay consistent and follow through and do with what they said they were going to do. Uh, think about it this way. What do we call people who are inconsistent and don't do what they said they were going to do? You know, One word that comes to mind is liars, <laughs> right? And right. no, right. nobody wants to be perceived. There's not a good word for people we call or deem inconsistent if you think about it. And nobody wants to be deemed that way, right? That's why there's a lot of external pressure as well as the internal pressure. So once they make that commitment, as I said, it's very hard for them not to fall through and, and do and behave in the, what they committed to. Uh, the problem is they've either already came in with a commitment that is going against what we need them to do. In our case, it's they're saying I'm only doing what my insurance pays for, but you're like, well, but that's not what you need. <laughs> you know, you need a lot more than that. Um, or we're just straight up, we're not getting actual real commitments out of our patients, not really. 
And so we wonder why they no-show on us and why they don't call us back to schedule their appointments for dental work or why they don't refer their friends and family or do that Google review we asked for because we didn't really get a commitment out of them to do so. So we got to get more commitments out of people. Uh, and then last but not least, the scarcity. Uh, a lot of people know scarcity. It's probably one of the number one things used in marketing uh, against us today. Uh, but scarcity, when it's real and it's ethical, is very powerful. And it's basically when resources are limited or dwindling, suddenly we want it more, and we'll pay more to get it as a result. So when we stand to lose something, we care a lot more about that than when we stand to gain something. But if you think about it, isn't that kind of in conflict with what we were taught in dental school on how to sell the benefits of treatment? The problem is, well, patients are, are much more influenced and motivated to do treatment if they understand the consequences of not doing your treatment <laughs> versus the benefits. So it's these subtle little right. things like that, that that if you understand it and know the sequence of when they apply, they can set the stage for more yeses. And like I said, we're not tricking people. We're not getting people to do anything they wouldn't do on their own. Right? They are, there's rational thought. There's emotion. People are always free to make their own decisions. What I tell people is if, if these principles, all we're trying to do is recognize when they're present in a situation and bring them to the surface for the betterment of us and the patient. So it's a win-win relationship with them okay, uh, for a long-term lasting relationship anyway. And all it's going to do is just set the stage for more people to say yes in any other way you were going to do it. Now, sometimes that's a small change in the number of people who say yes. Sometimes, based on the studies I talk about in my program, you're going to see it is a huge change in the way people act. And so an example I'll give is a guy took one of my workshops here in, in August, um, brought his team up, which I always recommend to do so I can have the most influence on them. And he had kind of set a goal for his practice for 2017, right, for this coming year in collections. Um, and he, he didn't think he was going to get it in 2016, which is why it was his 2017 goal. Well, his team took back the principles with him and the strategies I gave him. And in the last four months of the year, August, September, or was that five months? Um, so from August to the end of the year, guess what? At the end of 2016, he hit his 2017 collections goal. <laughs> okay, wow. that, that's how that's how powerful these things can be sometimes as a huge growth factor. Obviously, it makes sense, right? When you get more people to say yes for whatever you're asking them for more treatment in this case, well, obviously that sets the stage for growth. So. Absolutely. This is this is amazing stuff. Um, let me uh, – can you give us some examples? You talked about the principles. Can you give us some like something that I can bite my teeth into and understand? I, I kind of understand, but I'm not sure if I'm totally getting it. Yeah, well, you know, let's do a simple one, right? So let's go back to the telephone call. Yeah, let's talk about so, dentistry. So how do you get – Something in dentistry. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, let's talk about uh, – dentists have a problem with no-show rates, right, with people not showing up for their appointments. Right. And it co open chair time costs us a lot of money because of that. Majority of these are new patients, right, but some are existing patients. So how can we use the principles to set the stage for more people to show up for their appointment and do what they said they were going to do and, and come? <laughs> well, as I said, we've got to get more commitments out of them to do that. So one of the ways we do that is you ask a simple question. Normally, you end the phone call after you make an appointment, and your the team's response is, okay, well, we're looking forward to you on Thursday the 15th at 6, at 6 o'clock. All right, we'll see you then. Bye. Okay. So instead, we're going to change that to saying this. Hey, Mr. Jones, will you please call me if you need to cancel or reschedule your appointment or if, or if you can't be here for any reason? Will you please call me? And you wait for the person to say yes, right? They're not going to say no. No, I'm not going to call. <laughs> no, they're going to say yes. Okay, great. Well, by saying yes, they have just made a commitment to you. Well, now they're more committed to actually showing up for their appointment or at least calling you. If God forbid some reason they can't be there legitimately, at least you'll know about it, All right? right? Before, instead of the chair being there empty and you're wondering where the patient is. And so kind of what I have my team, they know to do is I don't care if people can't don't show up in the sense of if they got to reschedule, I get it. Life happens. You can't help it. All, right. All I want them to do is right. at least give me the courtesy of calling me to let me know that so I'm not waiting for, with an empty chair because let's say it's in hygiene, you know, and I can call somebody who's got an appointment three weeks away who's one of my retirees who's on my dental savings right. plans, right, an in-house discount plan I created for them. And they don't have to wait six months and a day to get their teeth cleaned like they do with 
most dental insurances. Okay, so I can get my retiree and say, hey, Bill, what are you doing today? Oh, I'm just hanging around the house. Well, that's right. Well, come, why don't you get your teeth clean? Come on up. Let's do this today. Oh, okay, cool. <laughs> right. <laughs> right? right, and I'll fill that hole, and now i got three weeks to put a new patient there. You know? okay. uh, but if I hadn't, at least I want them to call me, and this is going to get them committed to showing up or at least calling you to let you know they can't make it. And it's so simple. Will you please call us? Great. Hey, I'll let the other girls know you're going to call us. So everybody knows, right? The more public your commitment is, the more powerful it is that you're going to call us if you need to cancel or reschedule. Oh, and by the way, before you go, would you repeat back the day and time of your appointment for me? Just so I know I got it right right. in my system. Right. Right? So what does it tell you if they can't repeat back the day and time of their appointment? They're not committed. They were coming. (laughs) (laughs) Wouldn't you rather know that now? (laughs) Right. But if right. you can get them to write down their appointment time and then repeat it back to you again, even if they didn't know what to start with, right. they're now more committed. They're going to show up. Right, right, right. It's amazing. Can you give me an example for reciprocity? Because that's that's a hard one, especially in dentistry. At least I can't think of one. Well, yeah. I mean, with reciprocity, you got to think of gifts versus rewards, and the magic word you need to listen for. Is thank you. So gifts can be physical gifts like, hey, here's your present, here's your gift card, but they can also be uh-huh. non-physical gifts too, right? Like favors and uh, acts of kindness, uh, right? There's all kinds of other gifts as well we can give someone. But how do we know we really gave someone a gift that was significant or had some meaning to them? Well, we know it when they thank us for it. In some way, they say something right. positive about the practice like, oh, wow, I can't believe we're done already. Wow, this was the best visit ever. Right? Well, they're right. just telling you that you've given them a gift. They're thanking you. Okay, well, that's a key. Right. That's a mo- that's what Dr. Cialdini calls a moment of power that if you you've already given the gift. So if you turn around and ask right. for something in that moment, you're likely to get a yes. So if they say, "Wow, I can't believe we're done. That's a great visit." Well, fantastic. I'm glad you liked it. Hey, I tell you what. Doc said we got to get you scheduled for that crown and I need to get you scheduled for their year cleaning. Let's get those on the books. What works best for you? And they try to schedule them right there. (laughs) Okay. Uh, So it's number one, it's recognizing when the gift's already been given. Number two is what kind of little gifts could you could you give, right? And you got to differentiate gifts from rewards. You know, so like say referrals. Like if you if a patient refers somebody to your practice and you send them a gift card to thank them of some dollar amount, well, that's a reward, right? If you refer, then you get this. Well, technically, I mean, right. federal, that's illegal in every state in the country. Now, right. does every dentist do it? Yeah. <laughs> you know, they take one down, they're probably right. going to take us all down. But it, that's a gift. I mean, that's a reward, okay? But there's gifts can be more influential and more powerful, and it's completely legal in every state to give anybody a gift for any reason. Right. So, and the, the size of the gift doesn't matter, right? Doesn't have to be a fifty dollar gift, even a little five dollar gift card to Starbucks, Bucks, and Target, or the Home Depot, whatever. Your, whoever your patient is, is a powerful gift you can give them at the end of the appointment. Say, Mrs. Jones, hey, I'm just so thankful you're our patient. Doc and I just wanted to give a, a little gift to you to say thanks for being our patient. Tell you what, here's four gift cards. Why don't you pick one for yourself or two for yourself? And they're like five and ten dollar, you know, five dollar amounts. Maybe they pick one for five bucks. They pick two. They get ten bucks. But either way, the person's then going to turn around and go, "Oh, wow, thank you." And they're going to pick the ones that mean the most to them because they had a choice. Well, now you got a lot of reciprocity power in that moment to say, "Hey, my pleasure. I hope you enjoy that." Oh, and by the way, Doc said we need to get you scheduled. You know, let's let's get you scheduled. <laughs> or hey, would you mind doing this Google review for us? I'll send you a text and show you how to do it. Or, hey, do you mind? Do you know anybody looking for a good dentist? Great. Here, would you mind passing on this gift to them from us? Tell them we'd love to meet them one day. You know, I mean, there's all kinds of ways I've transitioned this into into whatever you want to ask for and the times you want to, you know, when do you ask for the referral versus the treatment? How many things do you ask for? You know, there's some other nuances there we don't have time to get into, but you get the gist, right? So I get it. Let me ask you this. Um, I'm sure a lot of dentists are thinking this. What if I give this gift and I don't get anything back? I wasted my money. Like, you know, I, I'm sure people are thinking that, right? That's why they like rewards yeah. more than they like gifts. 
That's right. Everybody focuses on what they're lo- going to lose versus what they're going to get. It's a scarcity mindset. Right. Can't help it. Right. Uh, the reality is, again, it's not going to work on everyone, as I said. But let's say you gave it, you gave out $105 gift cards, right? And you were after right. referrals. And you follow my referral right. system. I created a whole referral system that uses five of these six principles, and there's a sequence to it. But if you got 70 new patients that came in out of the $105 gift cards you gave, right? So if you got 70 referrals for 500 bucks, is that worth it to you? So this is what I asked Dennis. You know, I try to get him to make a commitment statement first and say, how much does a new patient worth to you? They're like, what do you mean? I'm like, well, would you pay five bucks for a new patient? Would you pay 10? And most of the time they'll say, well, sure, duh. Okay, well, that's all we're doing here. You're giving the five bucks to your existing patient and they follow the sequence they're going to refer someone. Now you just paid five bucks for that person. I mean, you gave the gift and they reciprocated by giving you a patient, which in essence cost you five bucks to get them. Right? right. So that whether I mean, the other with- 20 didn't pan out, it's the 70 you got that made it worthwhile. It's not going to be a hard ROI to get back. Let's put it that way. So uh, you're saying that typically if you, this works i mean in other words it's not like i'm going to give 20 cards and i get one patient you're saying if i get 20 cards i'm probably going to get if i do it right using a system i'll probably get 10 i'm just i don't know you don't i don't, I don't want to put words in your mouth but i'm just I'm trying to get some color of you know how effective it is yeah well it's a, the, effectively what i've been finding is from the people that have gone through my workshops that are that are using the system you know it's doubling or tripling their new patient numbers and it's the best marketing they ever spent but let's say out of 100 names, on average, around 60 to 68 are going to come in. Wow. So you think 100 gift cards, if you do it right, you know, at least you experience 60 plus turn into new patients. Again, it's not going to work on everyone, but most of these influence principles work on the majority. So on average, right. you know, at right. least probably around two-thirds uh, is, is a decent expectation. Oh, that's amazing. That's amazing. Any other final examples you would like to give before we wrap up? Whew. Uh, I've got too many. <laughs> I mean, because like I said, I use these to make your marketing language more effective, to get people to pay today. I mean, it's just – it's an We talked about of, commitment. We talked about commitment and reciprocity, right? Maybe pick something we didn't talk about, right? You didn't give an example. Uh, well, let's see. Well, you know, there's a um, – like liking is an easy one, okay? Uh, we like people uh, who are, are, you know, we like to do business with those we like, right? Our friends and whatnot. Um, right. So I'll tell you a quick story. So, but we like people who are like us as well, meaning have right. similarities, commonalities, right? Similar goals, and it doesn't matter how trivial the similarity is. So I had this one patient in, and you know. On the, I hate to say we prejudge people, but you know we prejudge people. We can't help it. It's human nature. So I'm staring at her at the front desk, thinking, mm, on the surface, I have nothing in common with this woman. What am I going to talk about? <laughs> you know. Uh, and so I was hoping one of my other associates at the practice got two female associates uh, work to work for me. I was thinking, well, at least maybe one of the other associates will get her, and they can say, well, you're a woman, I'm a woman. I mean, at least I got that. You know. Um, I mean, I got, I don't even have that. <laughs> So, of course, it was my turn, and I'm going to uh, introduce myself to the patient. I'm thinking, oh, great, here we go. I guess I'll just wing it and figure, just ask a bunch of questions until I find, hopefully, I find something we have in common. Well, I look at her medical history, and I was like, interesting. Here's a fun fact. So I go in and introduce myself. Hey, I'm Dr. Phelps. Hey, let me ask you something. Were you born October 14th, 1976? She's like, yeah, yes, I was. And I was like, wow, so was I. (laughs) We're birthday buddies. (laughs) <laughs> I mean, boy, same day, same year, everything. And for the, she lit up wow. like a Christmas tree. In the next 20 minutes, we had a conversation about our birthdays, being born in October, being Libras, you know, whatever that means, <laughs> right? Actually, Before I was I got born in October the business, 16th. Oh, there you go, October 16th, perfect. So, I mean, literally, uh, that's all we talked about. That's the only thing we had in common, and I just happened to see it, but I brought it to the surface instead of hiding it. Yeah, well, guess who left that day scheduled for her $12,000 treatment plan? Right. My birthday buddy. <laughs> you know, was it was it only because we had the same birthday? No. Probably no. some of the other things we right. did too. But do you think that had a big impact? Oh, yeah. 
Absolutely. Definitely. Absolutely. And that's a, that's just an example of liking and one of the ways we can use those. So. Right. As amazing, I say, they're all amazing. they're all subtly simple but extremely powerful. Yeah, I can see that. And I think the more you think about it, uh, you know, it, it's based on doing the right thing, right? I mean, being kind to somebody. And like you said, gift is not about money. You know, it's very different from reward, right? You know, yep. it's what we are... We as humans are supposed to do anyways, right? So you're not doing anything wrong here. You're doing what you're supposed to do anyways. But the fun fact is that now pays you back, you know. So that's, you know, like a bonus. That's it. Give to others what you expect to receive, you know, or what right. you'd like to receive. And typically that's what you will receive. Exactly. Yeah, I was I, telling my I kids had the other day. Of... I was like, if you want people to be nice to you, well, you got to be nice to them first. And then most of the time right. they will reciprocate. If they don't, then they're telling you everything you need to know about them. <laughs> you know. Right, right, right. No, absolutely. That's that's very, very, very true. You know. Uh, so it's based on solid principles, and it's based on, you know, the what makes us human, right? At least good humans. So yep. this is amazing stuff. Uh, tell me again the name of the workshop. I might want to attend because it sounds so interesting. Yeah, it's just called The Principles of Persuasion, or POP, uh, for dentistry. And so what I've done is just taken Cialdini's two-day workshop, which is just a generality on the principles, but you don't really know what to do with them. And I'm going to teach you the dental side and how I've used these things and the systems I've created in dentistry for all these topics we've talked about. Uh, but at the same time, I'll, I'm going to give you fish, but I want to teach you how to fish as well. So I'm going to teach you the science behind these things and to help you and their teams create new ideas uh, after the workshop as well, right? So it's not just a one-time thing. Um, and that's on my guide to them to yes.com website. Yeah, you can get info on those trainings. The guide them to yes.com. Yeah, that's it. G U I D E and then them to yes.com. All one word. Perfect. It was such a pleasure having you today, Dr. Fouts. Uh, I learned yeah, a lot, thank and you. I'm pretty sure I'm going to listen to this again just to make sure I didn't miss anything. Um, <laughs> yeah, uh, I hit you with a lot of stuff. So. <laughs> yeah, I think we did. I think uh, the people who are going to listen, they're going to get a lot of value out of it. Uh, so thanks again for taking the time. I know you're a really busy guy, so I really appreciate you taking the time today and uh, sharing your insights and uh, the tools and uh, the things you have created. So I think a lot of people will benefit from this. Uh, once yeah. again, uh, thanks for doing this. Thank you. Thanks for having me on. Thank you, Doctor. Appreciate it. Okay. Thank Before you. I Bye. wrap up, I want to thank all yeah. the listeners today to um, listening to another series of uh, Growing Dentist podcast series.